Thank you very much. Yes, my sister lives in Cairns for almost 20 years. So I was actually only there for a month of holiday and when I arrived she said, I've been called by so many people, you should go out on a tour. Yeah. <laughs> so I only have holiday clothes uh, and tomorrow I'll be in Melbourne so I hope I survive without a, a jacket and everything. Um, I'm very honored to be here and uh, I think I already had a few exciting days meeting, meeting many people, barristers, lawyers, NGOs, etc. who are all looking out what they could do in Australia and I really hope that some of you will find a way. Uh, yesterday we were in Queensland at the other EDO office where I gave a talk and at that time I was talking mainly about the agenda and all the things we were doing and a little bit about the legal stuff. Today I was asked to do a bit more on the legal stuff but I do start with what agenda is and what we've been doing so far because then you understand where we're coming from and why in the end we, we did the court case and then the second half will be really legal stuff so for the people in the audience who don't like that a little bit uh, detailed maybe but in the end if you have any questions or would like to discuss things afterwards please let me know I have quite a broad background of three different uh, studies three bachelor's, three masters in philosophy, law and business and that helps a lot of the work that I do because I understand very many different organizations. I once started at Shell because then I was young and naive and I thought I start to change the world from within. Uh, after a year I thought no, this will take me 50 years so I went back to university and did law and philosophy. And then I started to work at uh, a, com a governmental organization that was doing all kinds of environmental projects in Eastern Europe, so from Albania up to Estonia. I learned a lot about energy efficiency, renewable energy, working between governments, NGOs, and so on. I've been a campaigns director for Greenpeace Netherlands, and then thereafter I worked for a different universities with the best people in climate science in the world. So I kept on reading about climate, and during the years I became more and more worried. And I think when you're young, it's more, um, I don't know the word in, in English, cerebral, so with your mind. Uh, but when you get older, and then I got three children early this century, uh, and then you stop to think, what world will they live in? And then it crawls into your veins, it gets more emotional, and in the end you think, this is really not acceptable. We should make the change. Uh, and it's something moral also. For them, for the next gener generation, we should live a livable world. So you can see the, the changes that I've had in my life, also in my work, and how, how things change and how the activities that we did with Agenda changed over time. Agenda was actually founded when I was working for the Institute for uh, Transitions at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. That's an institute that studies how big transitions towards a sustainable world can be managed, steered, uh, what we can learn from previous transitions, uh, and it looks for the, the different ways to um, help newcomers in the market and help them to become bigger and become a real uh, new power in the market that changes the world from unsustainable to sustainable. And I've been done, uh, I've been working there and we had 40 PhD students, a lot of books, and I said in the end, yeah, nice that we all discuss this amongst ourselves, but what does it change in the world? So can we take all this knowledge and really make it helpful for the work? And that's how Agenda started. It was an urgent agenda to make the change to a more sustainable world. And actually the transition theory says there might be a long period that you don't even notice that things are changing for might be 30 years or over but a lot of people working on sustainability uh, and they have successes, they have failures and so on but you don't really see that the things are changing but they have a large effect, they are important and at a certain point of stage it takes off and then it might go very quickly and that's the point where we are now this is a period with a lot of chaos newcomers on the market, the, the old, the old uh, powers will be fighting more and more fiercely, it's not so nice anymore. And in the end you might up, end up at a more sustainable world, but you might just as well end up at a world that's unlivable. And we are the ones together that should try to make uh, the switch to a sustainable world. And there's no blueprint for that, but you can together try to find the points to steer the wheel in the right direction. And that's actually what we try to do. And in the agenda he said, well, the theory says you should have a long-term vision and a very concrete action plan and in the meantime 
try to find the front runners that are doing the right things and help to enlarge them, scaling up and so on. And if you think that there are things on the pathway towards your vision that nobody is taking on, then you try to start them yourself. So that were typically the type of things that we try to do within the agenda. And in that way, helping the movement of people that wanted to make the world more sustainable grow and move into the right direction. Well, this was our vision. We made it with a large group of frontrunners in the Netherlands uh, and in a real, say, uh, university type of way. So at first it was a very big package with many different things and then this group of people that was helping us said, no, that's not going to work, maybe 10 pages and a lot of pictures because otherwise nobody will read it. So that was where it ended up, uh, 10 pages and a lot of pictures. But the things we did were, in the first place, solutions. So in the Netherlands there had been in 2010 a lot of people that wanted solar panels and there was a kind of subsidy scheme that was who comes first gets first. Uh, and that meant that the people were really waiting at the computer until the uh, subsidy scheme would be open and then in five minutes it would be gone. And then there would be one big spark of people that would have the subsidy and 30,000 people that had nothing would be waiting for another year and then again. So not really a sustainable a way of working. The business people in the Netherlands said that's not something for us, so we moved to Germany, to Spain, to everywhere else. And I thought, if I bring those 30,000 people together and I'm going to buy for them at the same time, can I cannot bring down the price? And that's what was happened. If, if you would buy 50,000 solar panels, so 50, uh, uh, 10 megawatt at the time, the price went down one third. And that was panels and inverters and all the things that you need to put it on the roof. So that's what we did for thousands of people in the Netherlands at the same time. And when we did, did it, then everybody said, that's easy. So now there are hundreds of combined initiatives in the whole of Europe that do this. But when we did this, it was the very first time. And the same with electric cars. The first electrical cars that were made in series were produced in Norway. And nobody had them. And we bought them and we uh, offered them to the city of Amsterdam and a number of others and they said, yeah, that's a good idea. And then they had these electric cars and they thought, oh, now we need charging points. And they started public charging points and that was how the market started to roll. And then the real market parties came in and we could do something else. So every time we would be on the front of new markets, opening it up, giving people ideas, also doing it, and then we would move to the next thing. Well, I've, that was all very nice and we had a lot of fun and we uh, arranged many things. But then if you look after you, uh, you look for what did we do the past five years, there are 400 different energy companies of people that together buy solar panels and that have a joint windmill. But it's only one or two percent of the complete energy market. Are we really within 20 years moving from fossil fuels to renewables? And my conclusion was no, it's not enough. We can help all those people, but more should be done, and we cannot leave aside the government. So in the first five years I just did not do anything with government, and thereafter I thought, yeah, I should include both business and the government and all the people, and we should move together, otherwise we won't make the switch within 20 years, unfortunately. And for me, in that period, the urgency was even higher and higher, because if you keep reading all the scientific articles on all the different parts of the world, whether it's about roads or about North Pole or South Pole or whatever, it's all going faster in the wrong direction than scientists thought. And all the, all the models are incompetent in a certain way because they're not complete. They usually think that things are linear or going step by step, whereas things go like that. They are not linear, they are not uh, going uh, as people plan. And unfortunately, not uh, that usually they go into the right direction, no, usually they go in the wrong direction. So we should move much quicker. And we <laughs> rather stick our heads in the sand. Yesterday there was someone in the audience that said that that was she. <laughs> I did not know that this was a picture from Australia actually. Uh, but most people uh, rather go on doing what they did all the time. Uh, for most people it's very convenient to keep on doing the things. And well, you might not go to a nice evening like this and then you go on tomorrow as you did before. So that's not really what we want because if you look at the science, it's very clear that 800,000 years we had CO2 and it was going up and down. So all people who say that it's not always the same type of weather or that we have had ice ages, yes, that's true, uh, every 100,000 year an ice age. But the level of CO2 was within 180 and 280 ppm parts per million, so CO2 in a million air particles. We are now up there, 400 ppm. And the last time that we had this was 4 million years ago. 
and then the sea level was 40 meters higher, the Sahara was green and there was no North Pole. And if we have that all year round, now we only have this for part of the year, but if we have that all year round, it's an unlivable world. So we should move back. And the best scientists say, well, we should move back at least to 350 ppm. But all the policies in the world are uh, targeting on 450 ppm, so they really take a large risk because the policies of the world, even of the Climate Change Treaty, have two degrees, and the two degrees are based on 450, and 450 is 50% chance that we will have a reasonable living environment. Well, I think 50% chance is not enough. If I would build a bridge, and I would ask you to walk on the bridge, and you have 50% chance that it will break down, you will not do it, and you will certainly not put your children on it. But it is what I, we accept at the moment. Even within all the current policies, it's only the 50% chance of success. I don't think it's enough. So therefore, within our agenda, we are uh, arguing that we should make the switch within 20 years. So not 2050 as a target, which is the target for most international treaties and so on, but within 20 years. And that's a lot quicker, but it is still possible. Uh, if you would stop the underneath the, the greenest one, if you would stop right now with all CO2, it will take until the end of this century before you are at this 350, which I think is a much safer one. If you wait until 2050, you will run out of this graph, and it means that our children will not have a comfortable, comfortable world to live in, and that's an understatement. So, normally, I will now start to talk about the urgency, which I won't do today. Uh, and then I explain to people that I do tell a little bit about the urgency because I do not want you to go home only with the feeling that was a nice talk and you go on as you always did. I would like you to go home with the feeling, hmm, maybe I should do something tomorrow. Get those solar panels, eat a little bit less meat, do another type of light bulb, whatever, but start act and choose the right politicians. And if you buy things in the shop and there is a unsustainable and a sustainable for I choose the sustainable one even if it's a little bit more expensive so I don't do that today because I'm going into the details of the legal stuff but normally I will first do the urgency part and then go for the solutions and then when everybody's almost depressed I say there is still a solution and that's the part now last year we issued a report um, because I've been giving speeches like it more often in the Netherlands in Dutch and there were also uh, usually a lot of experts and that say, well, you might be right about the 20 years, but it is not possible. And that's why I spent two years in the Netherlands with all the universities, professors, institutes, everything, and asked them the question, is it possible? Uh, you can tell me later why you think it's not possible, but if there is, a, is there a technical reason why it's not possible? Is it a money thing why it's not possible? Do we not have enough people to do what's necessary? Uh, if that's really impossible, then I accept it. But if it's technically possible, if there's money enough, people enough, then I think we should do it. Then there is no good reason not to do it. And of course, uh, you probably understand that the outcome was, yes, it is possible. And then the second sentence of all these people would be, but. And then they would say, the government has never done something like that before, people don't want to change, all kinds of other reasons. But I think that if we feel the urgency into our toes, if we really know what our children will face, if we see the pictures, then we should move and we will move and we can move. So that's what we're doing in the Netherlands now. All those solutions and all the pathways that we have written down in this report, we are working on that, on the side next to the court case. And then the first question that people would usually ask is, can we afford it? Uh, and I usually like to start, well, our uh, request to all these professors and so on was the first thing is it should be a system that's affordable and that is just as safe as now, no blackouts. Uh, and we found out if we would do this, we would create 150,000 new jobs. People making houses and in the neutral, working on the new transport system, all the things that are in the report create many new jobs. And if you decide together that you will make this move within 20 years, there's always a lot of innovation following. So there will be many other effects. But we are just like you, we are not a coal country, but we are a gas, fossil gas country. And we had one of the largest gas reserves in the world. But it's gone in 20 years, because we've used it all for heating, hot water and selling it to other countries. So do we want to become dependent on Russia, or are we going to move to a society that's completely independent on renewable energy? 
I think for some people who don't believe in climate change, that's also a good reason to make the move. And I also I don't mind why you are moving as long as you are moving. We should make the move within 20 years. And what does it cost? It costs 1.5% of the GDP. That is a large amount, but we can afford it. We now spend 2.5% on oil, so we are used to spend a lot on energy. And this is a, an amount for a very rich country like the Netherlands that's possible. And in the end, the system that we will have in 20 years' time will be 3 billion cheaper than if you would go on with fossil fuels. So we will end up with a cheaper system and we are self-sustainable. And we save the climate. I would say, good deal. <laughs> so I'm not going into the details now, but what we usually do is we work on these uh, energy neutral houses, we work on other transport systems, we work on different food systems, on uh, production factors and so on. If you would do everything in the report, then you would have saved a lot of energy and what's still left, what you have not covered by making your house energy neutral and so on, we can cover with a lot of sun and a lot of wind and to some extent some other, uh, like geothermal and so on. But it's not a thing that there's not enough energy. If you see that square in the uh, north part of Africa, which is world, that's enough. If we would fill that with concentrated solar power, it would be enough for the whole world. So we have enough sun, we have enough space, it's just a, ma just a matter of organization. And I'm not saying that we need to do everything in Africa, but in the Netherlands we have a lot of roofs, we have a lot of uh, walls along the highway, we have so many space that's now unused that we could use for making energy. So there are so many different solutions, it's not a matter that they're not, the solutions are there, we don't have to invent <coughs> anything else, we just have to do it and organize ourselves. So the book ends with a page for people that say, what can you do in your own house, in your own home, with your own food and so on. So it's a book about what the government needs to do, what companies can do, and what you can do yourself. Because that's what actually is needed, that we all take our own role. So that's what, what we are doing in the moment. We're working on many of those solutions and see if we can uh, make this power shift that's needed for the transition. And what I usually ask from people is say, in the dictionary it says an activist is someone who acts. So I would like everybody to become an activist and not the one like Greenpeace that's hanging in a room by a power plate, but that you simply do what's necessary. And that means voting differently, buying differently. And in the Netherlands is the case that if you have a little bit of money in your bank, it will have much more uh, effect on your roof than if you keep it on your bank. Because 3,000 euros on, in your bank account will have an interest of 30 euros and on your roof it will be 500 euros. So there are many reasons to make the change. And uh, do what you can do and what you can afford, but at least do something. And I think it's also time that we go in the streets, that we do things physically. That we don't only think that a like or a retweet is enough. I think we should show to politicians, to leaders, that we are fed up and that we really want things differently. So there have been a lot of mass uh, happenings the last year and I think at the end of the year when we have to talk to Paris there will be a million people on the street. And I think that's good. I will be walking to Paris the whole month of November from Utrecht to Paris, more than 500 kilometers, taking a lot of people along the way just to address this topic and get the topic on the agenda of the media and so on. And I think one of, I, I'm almost coming to the legal case. The last thing, I think the divestment movement is a very good one. If we really take the two degrees seriously, if we don't want the world to be more than two degrees warmer, we can only spend one fifth of all the coal, gas and uh, oil reserves that are currently detected. And the four fifths should stay in the ground. That means that oil, coal and gas, and gas companies are not a good investment anymore. And what you're seeing is when this came a few years ago for the first time on the table, it was really being laughed at. But now, more and more uh, churches, cities, big investment companies are, are saying the same. They say, we are withdrawing from coal. And you see that the analysts simply look at newspapers and at all these announcements of all these entities that say, we move out of coal and say, okay, the credit rating for those companies goes lower because it's not so safe anymore. So even if they don't believe at all in climate change, they will simply look at what's happening. So you fight them with their own thing, with figures. And I think that's a very good one that's at the moment becoming bigger and bigger. We are helping uh, people in universities to go to our pension funds to say you should move out of 
go oil and gas because we have pension funds that are amongst the largest investors of the world. Uh, but you see it everywhere and you see more and more big ones like the Rockefeller family that says we uh, 50 billion will be, we will resolve and we will not go into fossil fuels anymore. And you see that with universities, churches, so this is really a big movement now that's growing very fast. Okay, the book, the case. We have a group of people that's a kind of think tank of Urgenda, and one of them is a lawyer called Roger Cox. Uh, and he got two children and he thought, what kind of world will they live in? And he read a lot about climate change and he thought, this is not going in the right direction. He started to read all the IPCC reports. It took him weeks, months, holidays, <coughs> spent lots of time on it, and he thought, what can we do in a still democratic society? Will the politics make the solution in time? No. Will this power from, from beneath do things in time? No, probably not. So the only thing he thought in a society that could make the change was the judge. He thought if I would put all the details in front of the judge, the facts, then we will not have a discussion about what someone likes or not likes or whatever. It's not a political discussion, it's a discussion about facts. And he wrote it down in this book, and I read his book, and I told him, okay, I'm prepared to do it. I would like to try to see if we can make a court case that wins. And I knew one other lawyer that I thought was extremely good, who had been trained as a lawyer and was a specialist in civil law. And I brought the two together, and they have been working on the case together in the past three years. Uh, in the beginning, a lot of fighting, discussing, saying this will never happen, etc. But slowly along the way, their belief that it would be possible was growing. And I think actually the three of us were the only three that thought that it would work. All the others in the Netherlands said, no, because the newspapers were following us and they would be calling professors and people in university and so on and say, what do you think about the climate case of agenda? And all of them said, this must be a marketing stunt, it's just PR, no, that's not possible. Most people didn't read anything, I must admit because they thought it was environmental law, or public law, or um, uh, human rights law, and it's not. It's sim simple civil law, it's tort law, and it's different from what most people think. But the, the reaction of most lawyers was, this is not possible, until the very, very last time. And even many people that are friends of ours emailed me afterwards like, I didn't think you would make it, but great. <laughs> So what we do, did we do? If you start a case in the Netherlands, you first have to do the discussions with the government. You cannot take them to court if you haven't tried it in a nice way. So we wrote a letter <laughs> to the government and we said, well, you have signed, you actually were, you were one of the few countries that started the climate change treaty in the early 90s. So you have said, we should stay below the two degrees. You said it's a very big problem. So we think you should do 40% less greenhouse gases in 2020. And then the minister answered quite rapidly, within two months, and said, we agree that it's a big problem, that we should stay below the two degrees, that the industrialized countries like the Netherlands should do between 25 and 40 percent CO2 reduction, but we don't want to be a runner, uh, and we think it's not good for our business, so we're not doing it. Okay. We were very glad that they wrote down, we agree on this and on that, and on the 25 to 40%. I actually think that they didn't have a lawyer at that time. <laughs> because they would probably have advised them to write another letter. <laughs> but we were also a bit annoyed, because most people still think that the Netherlands is a quite a progressive country. Well, we are not really, maybe on some topics, but on climate and energy, we are among the worst of uh, Europe. We have 25 countries in Europe and we are number 24 on renewables between Cyprus and Malta. Only at that time 3% at the moment 4. And most of that is wind energy and a little bit of solar. So we are not really as progressive as people think. And we are a fossil fuel state with Shell and a large gas company. So that determines a lot of what's happening in the Netherlands and we are not very progressive at all. So we thought, we don't do a normal court case, we start something new, we start crowd pleading. And that's uh, uh, not crowdsourcing, it's a death is asking people, will you join us? Uh, are you, for example, a legal expert? Do you know of any court case around the world that could help us? Let us know. Do you want to become a co-plaintiff? Write us an email and say, yes, I want to be a co-plaintiff. 
because we want to do it with as many people as possible. You don't have to pay anything. We will pay. We will do the work. You only have to say, yes, I want to be a co-plaintiff. So we started the court case with almost 900 co-plaintiffs and they have been with us all the time. And that was very nice because when we started, we handed in the summons and we went, didn't went there with agenda, we didn't do it by mail, we went there with hundreds of people. And it's only, say, putting things on a desk. But we were there with hundreds of people, children, balloons, everything, and we said, we want to start a court case against the state. And that attracted a lot of attention, of course, and then the newspapers started to ask all kinds of professors, do you think that this will work? No, most people said it will not work. And we are now saving on the whole all those newspapers that said it will never work, and no, it must be PR, and so We had a lot of fun. So that was November 2013 when we started. And then the government has to uh, react within six weeks, and then they got, can ask for another six weeks, and so on. So they answered, we answered, they answered. And then we had the first meeting with all the people, this year, April, in court in, in The Hague. And we went there with hundreds of people, and they only could have 180 there, so we have asked a friendly organization in the neighborhood to give us a room. We could put cameras in the room, so we have a broadcast as everything live, so everybody in the Netherlands on a computer could follow it. You could even follow it from China. Um, and this was actually, I thought it was very interesting because I thought most people will leave within an hour. It took from 10 in the morning to 4 at, mid at midday. Everybody was sitting on the points of their chair and they were really interested and it was very well to understand and it was a very interesting day. Uh, and all those people were there and then at the end of the day there were of course a lot of politicians that gave their comments and we put them on the camera. And the politicians, most of them said, say, uh, more than half of all the people's involvement said this is an interesting case and yes we are not doing enough it's good that Urgenda goes to, uh, to, to the judge that was actually funny because the lawyers of the state said well this is something that should be done in politics and this isn't something that's not for the judge whereas the parliamentary people would say it's very good that they go to the lawyer and to the, to the judge and so on so we put that in another film uh, the conference ladies, yeah, but it was kind of funny to see the opposite reactions and I think that's necessary too, to bring all those things in, in, in pictures and show it to people how inconsistent uh, the people in politics are. <laughs> well, at the end of, the, of this whole day, the judge said, we will give the verdict in June the 24th, 10 o'clock. And that's very uncommon, usually they will say, well, we will be there in about a few months. And they really determined it very specifically and indeed, on the 24th of June, at 10 o'clock, the three judges were sitting there and they were giving the verdict. And that was, uh, I would say, a, a very, very special day. Because we were there again with hundreds of people, we were all dressed up in white, and the people from state were all in black, so it was very easy to see <laughs> who was good and who was bad. <laughs> And what I found very special was that the court had decided to translate everything in English. So the very moment that we got the verdict, it was there in English already. So both the summary and the whole verdict. Whereas all the other things, we have translated our summons and our reactions in English, but it took us months and a lot of money. And probably it was not as good English. But this was perfect and it was right on the minute that the verdict was given. It was there on the website of the Dutch legal system. Um, so in a way, I thought that the judge was, uh, well, more or less helping us in that way because there were many people all over the world following this and they could read it immediately and understand it. Uh, and it helped me a lot because all the uh, Dutch terms that I now have to use in English are not very, uh, uh, the, the terms I would normally use, so I've learned a lot from it too. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's important for people to realize that this is civil law and uh, that it, this is not environmental law or it's international law, etc. Because there have been many journalists that wrote articles on this as well, international laws between states, so this is not possible. Yes, that's right. And the judge says that very clearly. Um, so it is. Uh, civil law, but we do use all the other parts of the law indirectly. And that's, I think, one of the important things to realize how it was constructed, that you can still use all these other types of, of, uh, of law, but not directly. And I will explain that in a moment. 
because the, one, the first thing that the state said is we have no legal obligation because our agenda cannot go to Article 21, no, it cannot use the harm principle, etc., etc. But, the, but the, the, the judge said, yeah, that's true, I agree, they cannot go directly to that, but the duty of care is a so-called open norm. And an open norm is something that you construct in, at your point of time and you look at society and you say what is the duty of care at this point of time? And it would be different 1800 than it would be now. I even think that 15 years ago it would be difficult for us to fight this case. But at this point of time it is possible. And indirectly you can still color those norms by looking at what did the Netherlands say on climate change? What did the Netherlands say within the European Union? What are all kinds of other things that the Netherlands have said these are applicable for my country and I'm living up to these standards? Because you use then these standards to color the open norm of duty of care. So the basic thing in this civil law case is that we say it's an unlawful act. And then an unlawful act is some very basic notion in civil law that is further explored the last, I think, 50 to 60 years in the Netherlands by all kinds of different cases and it changes over time. And the unlawful act has a number of uh, elements that you have to prove. And the first and most important one and the one that the judge spent most time on is this, do, does the government have a duty of care? Is there a hazardous negligence in this case? And then thereafter you have to prove that the, the state is the one that uh, has to act, that it's not something you cannot ask from them because there are other things even more important and a number of other things. But actually this most important part of this is, is this open norm. And I think, of course, the judge didn't invent anything. This was what we brought to the table. And I think that that was really the, the very clever thinker, thinking of our two lawyers. And the judge followed the pathway. So therefore, for every, anybody who is interested in law, I think you should read our uh, second uh, thing after the summons, because the, our uh, reply to the government has most of this part of the say, legal details. And that's really interesting to read, and also where we got it from, and what kind of case studies we used, etc., etc. Because the judge followed it in his verdict, and he didn't all, always say uh, where the details came from. Uh, but if you're really interested as a, a lawyer or whatever, you should really read that. And this coloring of norms is called the reflex effect. That was at least how this translate person translated it. We call it reflect working. I'm not really sure whether it's reflect effect or reflect working, but it means that you use all these other, other norms to create uh, what in this case is the duty of care. And I think, because we would go a little bit more in detail, there were two important things that uh, the state does have a lot of discretionary power, because that's of course one of the main things that the lawyers of the state said, was well, it's up to us, it's not up to the judge. Yes, you do have a lot of discretionary power, I've also discussed it with a lot of people here in Australia, also for the Australian uh, government, but not uh, 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 you cannot do everything. There is a kind of minimum level that you have to live up to. And that's the thing that you're going to discuss amongst yourself. What is this minimum level? Up to where is your discretionary power? And what's the line that you cannot cross as a government? Because a government should protect its citizens. It's a government cannot do everything it likes. And then there's, there's this minimum degree of care is actually the one that we were looking at. And if you want to determine this minimum degree of care, you go into all these, say, indirect things that color this, this notion. So the, the judge very much stressed several times this is a legal question. It's not a question of interpretation or, or of the, the judge is not inventing policies. It only looked at what have you declared yourself up to now, what have you signed, etc., etc. So it's looking at is there an unlawful hazardous negligence or not. That's the legal question. It's a new question, it's a very big question, he acknowledges that, but he says it's in a sense it's not a very difficult question, it's one we have to uh, look at in very many court cases. Uh, so the, but you, you do have discretionary power, but not unlimited. Well, then we went into a lot of detail along this doctrine of hazardous negligence. I would like to ask you, if you're interested, please read our reply, because that's really interesting. 
Um, and in the end it said, well, you have to avoid what they call impaired living uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and the objective and the principles of the climate change treaty, uh, you have said that you would live up to that. And those principles and those uh, the things that you said in your policy makers are part of your duty of care. So the judge went into many details on the climate change treaty. What, what was said there in all the different phases, what had we signed and so on. And for the climate change treaty there is every five to seven years a very big uh, science um, report. And the re but the report is not from the scientists alone. At the end, the 195 countries make a summary and they sign it. They say this is the body of knowledge that we acknowledge. And as the Netherlands, we have always acknowledged that. We, up to 2010, we were actually quite front-running. And two of our best institutes are the ones that give a lot of knowledge to this uh, report. So the Dutch government, in this case, did not dispute that. They said, yes, this body of knowledge is true, and, and we acknowledge that, and it's our own institute that made a large, large part of it. So the judge said, well, if you have acknowledged that then, that this is true, then that's part of the norms that you accept. So the coloring of this open norm, I use everything that you have said during the climate change treaties as part of this open norm. And then he, he was really looking into detail, like what principles are part of this climate change treaty. You have the principles of fairness, that you should not do things that impair the future generations, so you should balance the current and the future generations. You have the precautionary principle, uh, sustainability principle, but also we're part of the EU, and in the EU we have said we want a, a high protection level for climate change. And that's all accepted by the Dutch government, and that's all part of our principles. So the, the judge simply said, well, you should then live up to your own principles, that is part of your duty of care, and this for, for me it's an important viewpoint. So he stressed again and again, there's no direct effect, I'm not using them directly, but I use them as a viewpoint on what we think you should do and when you act wrongfully. And then he said, well, we should look, of course, into the details of the Climate Change Treaty. And he really was looking into many details. I'm impressed by the three, three judges, because if you read it, there's so much on the details of climate change and of many things that we have been discussing amongst countries on how we divide and, and, and all kinds of uh, measures that we have been taking in Europe on, on uh, trading and so on. So they said, well, the nature and the extent and the damage of the climate change is very clear. Uh, it's also foreseeable. We, there's many things. Um, and if the just looked at it, it says, well, climate change is very big, irreversible, and, and has ser serious consequences. And there is a need for precautionary principles. And you have acknowledged that. And the global emissions are currently so high, and they're still going up, that they're insufficient to reach reach the two degrees target. And you said you would help reaching the two degrees target. And he said there is a very high chance of climate change, so there is a very big risk. It's, it's an enormous risk. And therefore, mitigation measures should be taken as soon as possible. So that was the conclusion from reading all the science and so on, and from what the Dutch government has signed off. So it's not his own conclusion, it's actually the conclusion that we made ourselves in the whole process of being part of the Climate Change Treaty. And I was very uh, pleased that he put a lot of things in writing, like he said, faster redu reductions are better than slower reductions, for cost reasons, but also for limiting the chances that, that it will get worse and giving our future generations more chances of success. And he says, well, we've been knowing this since the early 90s, so you cannot say that you didn't know or talk yourself out of it. Uh, so we do have a serious care and we have to take the measures that are necessary. And therefore you should take a high level of care and realize the statutory and instrumental framework that's needed for it. So that's all very clear in writing and I'm very happy with all these details. Um, and, they, and then the state, of course, said, well, that will be very expensive. And he went through all the documents. He said, you can afford it. Your two institutes have made all the accounting things and it's not too expensive for the Netherlands. Actually, there are a lot of countries around you, England, Denmark, Germany, who are doing much more, 30 up to 40%. They can afford it. 
you are also a rich country, you can afford it. And immediate action is more cost effective than delaying it until 2030 or later, because that was one of the things that the, the, the Dutch government tried and said, we will do something in 2030. No, said the judge, you should do it now in 2020, because you have declared yourself that the minimum level is 25 up to 40 percent in 2020. And the sooner you do it, the better for the future generations, the better for the current citizens of the Netherlands. And we now have a, a, a goal of 16 percent, and we, we, they said in court we might reach 17, but it's less than 25. And the judge simply said, you said 25 is the minimum, then that's the minimum. So, uh, then the state said, we do adaptation, and the judge also looked in that and it said, no, adaptation is when it's already all gone and you have a problem, uh, you should prevent the problem for the next generations and for the younger people now. So mitigation is much better. And we also don't accept your uh, excuses that capture, uh, carbon capture and storage will do it, because that's an unsecure and it will take much longer and it will be expensive and there are, there are other more cost-effective ways. So that's not an argument either. Point. So you do have a duty of care to mitigate as quickly and as much as possible. I would say that's a very good statement. <laughs> and then of course the main argument of the Dutch state was uh, this is up to us, this is not something the judge can decide on. And in, if you read the verdict it's about 10 or 20 times that the judge says yes you do have a large discretionary power, I agree both because of the convention and because of this and because of that, but not unlimited. And here you have stated yourself that there is a very high risk, we should start, stay below the 2 degrees, etc, etc, and therefore you cannot just do whatever you like, you should take care of a certain minimum level that you have acknowledged yourself. And there are no other ways to do it, you have to limit the greenhouse gases, and you don't actually have other options because that was what the state of course tried about emission trading and this and that and all those things were slashed based on science and based on what the government had said in all kinds of documents before because that's the funny thing of a court case, you just bring facts to the table and they can't lie, at least usually they don't so, um, so the judge did use all these different uh, uh, principles and all the things that, that were said and said well the state has a serious obligation towards the future generations to act now and it's cheaper to prevention is better than cure uh, and actually you didn't come up with any other argument so in the case of Australia you could for example say the coal industry is very important for us the Dutch government didn't say anything about the gas industry is very important for us but suppose that, that, he, uh, that Australia would do that then the judge would weigh this and would say, okay, what does it cost you then if you stop your coal industry? And then on the other hand, you will see what climate change costs. Well, I can tell you that is way more. And specifically if you look this century, so even if they would make this balance, then probably climate change would have won. But the Dutch government didn't want to do that because they knew that they would lose it. There were so many reports that we had already put in all our detailed material for the judge that this was not really a very good argument. But it just said, well, you didn't give any good argument, so there are no other reasons why you should not do it, so you should do it. And then the state said, well, we're only 0.5% of all emissions in the world. Well, you are 1.5%, but if you have almost 200 countries, 0.5% is just your fair share. And we have in the climate treaty, uh, one of the first sentences is that we should, everybody should take its fair share and that uh, industrialized countries should do more than developing countries and so on. And we have uh, started the climate treaty because no country can do it on its own. So one of the basic principles is this whole notion of shared but differentiated respons responsibilities. So the, 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 the judge simply said 0.5 is an amount that you can do and that you should do and every country should do its own share and you cannot hide beyond, behind other countries uh, I think that's the same for, uh, for Australia and even if it's just small numbers it's not nothing and if everybody do, does the same small numbers we still get there so then the state said uh, Urgenda does not have no interest and the court said well we don't agree uh, it's in our bylaws that we are there for the transition to a sustainable society 
in the Netherlands and beyond and so on and so on and he went through everything and he said no, agenda does have an interest because it comes up for the general good and in the Netherlands that is possible that an NGO does that in other countries it might be uh, civil, c civilians who do that or class action or whatsoever but within our country an NGO can do that um, and the court said yeah you are amongst the 10 uh, countries with the highest per capita emissions in the world Australia is number two, so we have many things in common, and we are even in the top 25 in absolute figures. So we are we are a big emitter, like Australia. It's also in the top 20. And then the Netherlands said, "Well, we cannot do more than what we have said within the European Union," and that's of course a laughable excuse because Germany, Denmark, England—they're all doing more than what we have promised within the European Union. So, so they just said that's nonsense and then they, we, we have the so-called waterbed effect that if we do less others may do more and the judge also said well we've seen other countries do more and we don't see any waterbed effect so that's nonsense too. Besides if there would be a waterbed effect the science has said that it would be 12% and we, I, I also think even if it would be 12% then that's not enough as the danger of climate change is so big so that's also a nonsense argument. So, and then there was this level playing field, which I think is also a very stupid argument. If all the countries surrounding you are doing much more, and you say, well, if we are going to do more, our industry will be harmed. So the judge said, well, that's nonsense, because up to 2010, your goal was 30%. And at that time, you still thought you could and would be doing it. And a few years later, you made it 16%. And now you suddenly say that you can't do it, and that it's bad for your industry. And the, the funny thing was in April when the judge directly confronted the lawyers of the state with you did 30% in 2010, is it not possible anymore? They said yes, it's possible. So I think the lawyers were not really very good, but we were happy about them. So the conclusion was due to the severity of the consequences there is a duty of care to mitigate uh, and the, st the, uh, the state currently does not meet the standards that have been set by science and by all these countries together to stay below the 2%. And then it said, well then, he made a large story about his discretionary power and he said, I'm not going to ask you 40%, but your minimum level is what you should do at least. So I give Urgenda 25%. And if you want to do more, that's up to you. And how you're going to do it, that's up to you too but your own standard that you have set amongst all those countries and that you've written so many Dutch policy documents you should live up to your own standard so I give you 25% point well then the main uh, argument of the state was this is not something for the judge and therefore the judge spent quite a lot of pages on this topic because that's probably the reason they will appeal because they can go to a higher court and then in the end to another higher court and then uh, the judge very well explains, well, we have this separation of power, the so-called trias politica. But that does not mean that everybody has his own power and that there is no interference. It actually means that there is a balance of power. And the judge is a democratic force. And uh, in, in our law, it said that the judge has to make a decision if there will be a citizen or an NGO that asks for a ruling. So actually, he said, I could not even say no. If they put a legal question that's right in front of me, I have to act. Uh, and then, uh, a government has a lot of discretionary power, but it's not in unlimited, and I'm also there to protect citizens against government. That's exactly one of the reasons why we have these balance of powers, that as a citizen, you can go to the judge and say, government is not treating me right. So they, he spent a lot of time of explaining the theory and the thinking and so on. So I think it will not be easy for the state in appeal to throw that out of the window. So he said, um, I must protect the citizens that, that come to me and ask for, uh, for a decision. And I don't see any other compelling social interest against which I have to balance this because you did not bring them forward. So I also think that the lawyers did were kind of lousy, they thought we will win this, they were really arrogant and thought that this would never happen. Uh, and I think, I don't agree with it, but they could have brought m many more things to the table to make it at least more of an intellectual debate, which it was hardly. <laughs> um, 
we were acting also on behalf of all um, almost 900 citizens. Uh, but the judge very elegantly said, well, we gave Urgenlast the maximum that it could get, the 25%. Uh, the citizens, if, it, if they would have a standing, would never get more, so I'm not going to, to discuss that. So he said, I'm not going to say whether they do have a standing or not. Uh, they have already everything they wanted. And that's actually quite a nice way, because if, if you would really deep, uh, go deep into that question, then we would have probably uh, had to bring many more things on the table, because they are not acting on behalf of the general good, uh, as, as the NGO agenda did. So actually this verdict was for the NGO agenda, and not for all the individual people. Um, but I think in Australia, if you would like to do something <coughs> on behalf of a number of people, it is possible to say the droughts, the flooding, the fires, many things that will be happening and are already happening because of climate change. And if you look at the next century, there's so many things that you could make a case of. I think that it will be possible because the science is so much more clear than 15 years ago. Well. Um, we were obviously very happy. So as soon as the judges went out of the room, they were yelling and crying and hugging. And it was really a very strange court because normally it was like a reception because everybody would come to us and kissing us and etc. etc. And there were, oh, I think, 50 different journalists and cameras and so on. And it went within an hour all over the world. I was surprised how quickly this went because we would be calling people like we won. They said, we know already. <laughs> so, and what I was very surprised about that this is not only a legal case. There were so many people that called us and said we were crying in front of the TV. I have hope again. I'm going to start this again. Or now I think I can still do this. And so many people that had gotten depressed after all these years fighting climate change and not getting any further in their uh, belief that I think it's also a case of hope and that what you now see in the Netherlands is that also the landscape within uh, newspapers, TV and so on has changed. So they're not discussing anymore, is climate change happening? Suddenly climate change is a fact. And they're now discussing in the newspapers, how could we reach 25%? Is it possible what our agenda has asked? So they're calling all kinds of institutes and so on and there are spreads of pages in the newspapers about the way to go. And I'm really glad with that because we're finally now working on this solutions track, which was what we were doing all the time, and one of the reasons that we did try this court case. But well, you've just heard the story about uh, uh, all the things that are happening. I'm very happy that a group of eminent people has been made, made the, the Oslo principles. They came uh, out in the open just a week before we had the hearing and uh, in my sense uh, there were many uh, things in, in those Oslo principles that said that what we were doing was exactly on the right track so it feels really as a kind of wind in our back. Um, we think that there will be more and more court cases. The Belgians have already started because they also use the Dutch language. They have already filed one. Uh, the Norwegians uh, are almost ready and we've had numerous requests from all over the world of people who wanted to go into the details to see if they could do the same. So that was the reason that I did accept all the invitations this week because I really hope that many people feel empowered now and get more energy out of this court case and think, let's try it. Because it is possible. Uh, you really have to go deep into the details. Uh, I can speak very uh, easily, but it's more difficult than, than, than I say, but it is possible. And I think that we, we have translated everything, that you can use 80% of it. So that makes it you don't have to do two years of research, and you only have to do the very last part of translating it to your own system. And I hope that that uh, happens more often. At least you have seen in the past with tobacco, it was not the first case that won, but after so many years, now finally people who are fighting the tobacco industry win. It was also with the rights for blacks and whites to have education together and things like that. It, it took a while, but at a certain point, there was a, a judge that said, yes, the constitution says there's no reason to discriminate between black and white, we should do it differently. So the judge is actually a, fact, a factor in society that at certain points in time can really make a large switch and it might, might not be the first case, it might not be the fifth, but at a certain point it will switch. 
And we were very, very lucky that at the first case, this three, these three persons had the courage and the wisdom to do it. Um, and so it might not happen as quickly in every other country, but I think that a change is going to happen. And um, I hope for Australia that it will be happening quicker. Because I think there's a lot to do here, and uh, you have the same democratic system, and you have also this thing of the duty of care and so on. And you just should think about who should start it. If it's not an NGO, maybe it's citizens, maybe it's firemen, maybe it's farmers. There's so many groups that are having problems with climate change already, or certainly will have many more in the future, that there should be enough that can do it. And you have your reefs that get more acidic every day and are already more acidic, 30% more if you compare it to 1850. Well, uh, 2050 they won't be there if we go on the track. And if you would look like balance the amount of money that you get from the reef and the whole tourist center and, and from the coal powered uh, system, well, it might be an interesting uh, thing. I think if we all do our thing everywhere, at home, at work, in the courts, etc., we can make the change in time. And you have a very good country for wind and solar, much better than we have. We can do it within 20 years, so you can do it much easier. And if you see all those cyclones in the world, there are a lot of villages over there who are for weeks and even months out of power because they're not big enough. If they would have their own decentralized uh, renewable energy, they would be much earlier back on power. So there are many other reasons, job, innovations, clean air, etc. But also to be self-supporting in, in all those remote areas. So there's so many reasons that you can bring to the table. And I really think we should talk about the new economy and talk about the things that we can do to create a new economy that people like and that creates healthy jobs and not have some left and, and, and right thing or green and not green. It's about the future of our children, right and left-wing children. And I think we should much more talk about that and not about the things um, that currently are under discussion. And I think Coal is a dead man walking. Um, the the coal-fired power plants in America in the past five years, 50% were shut. China is, is slowing down. Germany is slowing down. There's more and more people who don't want to invest anymore in coal. Just do you wait until it's literally fallen over and then too late start with actually the new century? Or do you stick in the last century and wait and uh, don't grab the chances that are out there? So I would really make it an economic story and much more positive um, and not fight the old things but the new things uh, and, and that gives, generates way more energy uh, and my last message is that don't think that it is not possible because you should try and only afterwards like we you can say it was really possible thank you <laughs>